Hello. Good evening. Who's so nervously awkward? You were like, we did not sign up for this, Carol. This is not why we came back for this weekend, a sex talk. It's exciting. It's good. I'm nervous, too, um, because this is my second talk back after about four months of maternity leave. I have got um, three little kiddos. Well, first, I'm married to um, just the best man. I wish we had slides, you and ooh and awe. He's fantastic. His name's Jeremiah. We've been married. Um, we just celebrated our five-year anniversary a couple days ago. We have three kiddos to show for it. It's a lot. Uh, it's a lot. We have a three-and-a-half-year-old, a one-and-a-half-year-old, and a, one a three-month-old. So um, I've, I've been in a bit of a, a sabbatical, a bit of a hiatus, and loving the rest, but I'm also just burning with fire and with passion and with excitement to move back into this space and to continue these conversations that are so incredibly important. And I love that it's kind of a mixed bag in here tonight. There's students in here, there's parents in here, there's alumni in here. I love gathering because this is the body of Christ. It's diverse, different ages, different demographics, different seasons of life. But the beauty is that when the body of Christ comes around the word of God, we can open and unpack things and see how it comes to life in like 10, 20, 50 different directions in the lives and the hearts in here. So... Let's just shake out the nerves real quick. Turn to your neighbor and just say, we're talking about sex. Just say it. <laughs> oh, I love that y'all did the accent. That was good. Y'all picked that up quick. Um, and we'll jump in. I want to start us in prayer because um, it would be awesome if it was a, a powerful, neat talk and you walked out of here, moved, and maybe with nuggets of knowledge, but it would be miraculous if the Holy Spirit entered into this place and he took the words spoken and he tailored them to your heart. And this is, this is what God does. This is who he is, he intimately knows us and he loves us and he delights in us. And so I wanna step into prayer because if he's not present, then none of this matters. And I think it's important that we all um, just, just find a posture of welcoming what he would have to say to us. We would let down walls of nervousness or angst or confusion or excitement or whatever it may be and just find a posture of open hands and an open heart and say, Lord, speak. Dear God, we come into your presence, Lord. So grateful, grateful that we live in a nation where we can freely come together and lift your name, Jesus. We don't take it for granted. I'm grateful that we have access to your word, God. Would you write it on our hearts? Thank you for gathering each and every person in this place. Thank you for this time, God. You are holy and you are powerful and you are full of authority and you are just. You are the God of the heavens and the earth. And in the same breath, God, you are intimate, you are kind, you are patient, and you know every hair on every head in this room. And we praise you for that. God, we open our hands and our hearts to whatever you would speak. Holy Spirit, would you come and would you move? You're active and you're alive, God. And I just pray, Lord, that hearts would be open and receptive. That where we feel stirrings or where we feel tension, God, we wouldn't run from it, but we would respond to it, God. And where we feel wounded and weak, God, would you salve us and heal us? By the power of your blood, Jesus, we commit this time to you. We love you, we praise you, we thank you. In your sweet and holy name, amen. So, I um, love talking about this stuff. Is anybody into the Enneagram? Okay, decent wave. I'm like, I'm like moderately into it, like, found my number, researched everything I could possibly research about it, but I don't really know anything else about any other numbers, but I know I'm an eight. And so, okay, female eight in the house. The old people are like, watch the Enneagram, just Google. Um, actually don't, 
you'll wind down a Google trail and you'll be on there forever. The point is, I'm a challenger. I like to challenge. I like to tackle hard things because I think it's often the hard things that become the holy things in our lives. When we're willing to wrestle with the hard things, God unveils a lot of holy. And it seems like the topic, the conversation of sex, especially within the church, within the body of Christ, is one of those hard things. We don't really know how to talk about it, or we dance around it, or um, we feel a great deal of shame about it, or we um, just kind of hope things will play out and fall into place. We're, we're, we're significantly emaciated from the bread of life when it comes to the conversation about sex, and because no one really facilitated these conversations with me. I had significant um, struggles and hardships in this arena before coming to know Jesus. And then mind-blowing and heart-exploding revelation in this arena when I came to know Jesus. And I just can't stay too silent about it when you Learn and find and know a good thing, I believe, is the body of Christ it's worth raising our voices about. And I think when it comes to all things sex, presently we have been kind of bullied out of the conversation by a world that loves to talk about sex. They worship it, exalt it, twist it, cheapen it, pervert it, are entertained by it, have dehumanized it. The world is in this loud, screaming match of ever-changing opinions and thoughts and ideologies and focus and conversation about sex. You can't even watch like a dog food commercial without it somehow over-sexualized. It's, it's traumatizing. It is everywhere. It is shoved down our throats. It is right before our eyes. It is all consuming. And it's this world saying, figure it out. Do what you want to do. You have the freedom with your body, with your life. It's just sex, right? It can be casual. It can be detached. It is whatever you would make it out to be. And the world has a lot to say about sex and invites us kind of into this maze to wander and figure things out for ourselves. And yet I look at the world and it's the very same culture crying out, hashtag me too. I'm wounded, and I'm confused, and I'm hurt, and I have effects, ripple effects of my sexual decision making, and I have repercussions, and I really am, am, am traumatized by this area. This is the same world that's telling us to figure this ever-changing thing out. And it coaxes us kind of down a path of sexual confusion and exploration and questions and I walked down this and it was so challenging because really it's just kind of left to us to figure out. I think growing up for me at least, um, th my parents kind of assumed the church was talking to me about it. The church assumed my parents were talking to me about it. Therefore, no one was really talking to me about it. And this culture was painting the picture of all things sex and sexuality to me. And I love that it's kind of multi-generational in here because we, we see, I think, almost this cyclical cycle of things repeating themselves over time because the conversation wasn't had with us, so we navigated really muddy water and we were wounded and hurt or confused. And we came out on the other side and we feel a lot of shame or guilt, so we don't really know how to talk about it, so we don't have the conversation with our, our children. And it kind of has just continued on forward, almost buying in to the taboo nature of this talk, like we're not supposed to have it, but the reality is that sex is God's invention. Is it? It is. Sex is God's invention. He created it with purpose. He created it with power, with beauty. It was given to us as a gift from God. We don't use this language around it much, but 
Sex is God's invention. It's a unifying gift in the right context, a powerful tangler of souls. It is actually a weapon against the enemy in the right context. We rarely talk about that, but it's a powerful weapon against an enemy who wants nothing more than division. It is a unifying gift. It is actually an act of worship and praise and thanks to a God in the context of what he designed. God talks a lot about sex. In the scriptures, literally the first conversation that God has with man involves sex. And so to talk more about it in a God-honoring, holy, edifying, beautiful way is to look more like the one who created it. But this hurting world that's confused and broken is kind of looking at the church for just a glimpse, just a moment of, do you have anything that would offer me some hope or some clarity or some healing? And they look to us and we like don't even know what to say. And I kind of wonder why. I have to sit back and wonder why it is that we're relatively silent about this topic. And I think there's kind of a few things that shake out here. Number one is that some of us are wounded. We're sexually wounded in some capacity early on, out of our own control. That's a big factor of why we're silent. Some of us are uncertain or misinformed or uninformed or we don't really know that God has so much to say about it. Some of us are misunderstanding who God is in light of our sexual sin, and so we're very closed off, very afraid. Maybe if I don't talk about it or recognize it or acknowledge it, maybe if I just keep going about my way, then I won't have to associate these two things so we stay silent about it. Some of us are navigating a tremendous amount of shame because lo and behold, even the body of Christ is dealing with this sin struggle but we're not supposed to be right. And so then when we do, we don't know how to navigate the weight of that shame and the enemy wants nothing more than to silence us in shame. Because scripture says the power of life and death lies in the tongue. So if he can hold your tongue and keep you silent, then death can come to your heart, your spirit, your courage, your passion, your relationship with God. And as I was specifically praying over this gathering in the hotel room, I, I, I got a very specific word from God that I want to share as another factor, I think, that is affecting us in having this conversation. And I don't know who it's for. It's for somebody in here. Maybe it's for 20 people in here. I'm not sure. But the facet that I think some of us often navigate in silence around this is due to the fact that we have dabbled in it and felt conviction from the Holy Spirit, and we stuffed that conviction down, and we kind of continued forward and we stuffed that conviction down and over time we've been moving, overriding the Holy Spirit's conviction in us and stuffing it down to the point that we really ultimately, if we were being completely honest, are pretty desensitized to the conviction of the Holy Spirit when it comes to sexual purity, when it comes to God's design, when it comes to navigating this with any form of truth. And he drew me to Matthew 13, 15. It says, for my people's hearts have become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears and they've closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and I will heal them. And so I don't know who it's for and if that's been your narrative and you're kind of knowing that you're navigating this sexual decision making in life and a lot of confusion and you feel the conviction and the tension but you just kind of want what you want and so we keep moving and what you're stuffing down to really now you're at a point where you can open your computer and flip open your phone or, or crawl into your girlfriend or your boyfriend's bed sheets and really the conviction isn't even there anymore and we've rationalized a way that this is fine and this is okay and I would warn as a, a lover of Jesus and a lover of people that it's a dangerous place to be when we've navigated that deep. Oh, but God says if we would open our ears and open our hearts, he would heal us. And this was a place I navigated in, so my heart is particularly tender to it. There's so many reasons why we're silent, but I think it's important to look into the word of God and find our voice 
around these topics again, find his still small voice, the voice of the good shepherd guiding us in truth here. So when I look at scripture, I see that the first conversation had with man involved sex. Is that Leviticus, Cheryl? Because I saw something about livestock. No, that's not it. It's earlier. It's Genesis. <laughs> Sorry, I shouldn't. Um, I, <laughs> like a filter at times. I'm not even funny. I just really think I am. Uh, Genesis 1, 27 through 28. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. And then God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and govern it. Reign over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, all the animals that scurry along the ground. When I look at this scripture and I hear these words from God and I read in to what he's saying here, it's that God created you and me as the pinnacle of his creation with plans, with purpose over our lives. We are made in his image. No other creature made in his image. You are not just here, you are his made by God, for God. He made human beings in his image, and then he blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply. And what we see here is a marriage between two very distinct things right off the bat. When it comes to the sexual conversation, we see that God's marrying two things. Be fruitful be productive, be constructive. I've made you in my image, the pinnacle of my creation. I have plans for you. I have purpose for you. I have passions. I've knit into you strengths, gifts, talents, calling on your life. Be fruitful. Move with focus, uncompromised in holiness and purity. Walk with me. Be fruitful. And he marries it together with a sexual instruction. Multiply. In this covenant, he's given Adam and Eve he says, multiply, fill the earth. Sex, it's great. He marries these two things together. Our inherent identity is image-bearing creations of God and our sexual instruction. And these two things were always meant to be intertwined. Our sexuality, our design in his eyes, their beautiful collaborative union here. But what do we see happen in the garden? We see Eve choose to choose for herself what is best for her, right? When she takes of the fruit from the garden, tree, the knowledge of good and evil, in light of temptation of an enemy saying, surely you won't die, surely you can choose what you want, it'll be okay. Maybe God's withholding something from you. You do you, you choose what you want. As Eve takes of the fruit and sin enters into the equation. And this so often is what happens in our lives and what happens to this union of assignment from God. It's what happened in my life is when it comes to our sexuality, our sexual decision making, really it begins at the heart layer of saying to God, I kind of want to choose for myself what I want here and what I think is best for me. And what happens is when this sin occurs, there is a severing of these two things. Our inherent identity, our sexual instruction, sin enters the equation. Sexual sin enters the equation. There's a separation, and for the rest of our days, we use this to find this. Sexual sin becomes the very thing we use to find our worth, our value, our identity. I want to feel loved. I want to feel seen. I want to feel known. I want intimacy. There was a severing here of what God always intended you to know, you are valuable in my sight as I made you. And we say, but God, I want to figure out me. And then we navigate a winding road of trying to figure ourselves out by ourselves. And we become desperate to know an identity that was always sure in the eyes of God. This was where my story began. It was never like the big thing. It's never the crazy thing. It's often, I shouldn't say never, but it's often not that we are chaste and pure and walking faithfully and undistracted and we wake up one morning and we're like, 12 men. 
it's time. Like it's never an extreme shift to debauchery or to brokenness. Usually it is the small decisions, the tiny steps of I want to choose what I want, what I like, what I think is best for me. And it's these tiny steps that lead us deeper and further from God, from his design, from his truth. And that's what it looked like for me. I was raised up in a Christian home, which was wonderful. But what was communicated to me pretty early was really an exaltation of virginity, and that was really it. I saw the word of God, or I saw this sexual instruction, what I was hearing at church, or what I was being taught, as a very narrow viewpoint of do this, don't do that. This is right, this is wrong. Follow these rules, do it right, deny, 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 deny. It's awful, it's horrible, it's terrible. And then when you stand before your husband, say I do, and it's magical. And I'm like, (laughs) okay. And so what? I really functioned in, goodness, I remember being um, young. I think I was nine years old. When I went down into my mom's bedroom one day, my poor mom, y'all pray for Heidi, it's been a tough road. But I went down into her bedroom, she had this love seat next to the window, and I was doing a project, um, a, a report on snakes. And so I came down into her room to ask her one of the most confounding questions of all time. Don't Google it. You'll never find the answer. No one knows. How do snakes have sex? It made no sense. I couldn't figure it out. I'm expected to report on this. These were pre-days of Google. So I came downstairs asking my mom how, in fact, snakes had sex. And it was an innocent question, but the language I started using and the terminology and some of the things I probably said made my mom go ghost white because what she didn't realize was that at nine years old, I had already had our neighbor, Natalie, take me down to the neighborhood fort by the creek and tell me everything there was to know about sex. Natalie, I didn't ask. I was nine. But she unloaded all she knew just a few years older than me in a graphic, perverse way and, and, and planted seeds of language and thought and perception in my mind. And also at nine years old, what my mom didn't realize was I had opened one day the, the door of my dad's truck and a playing card, like a poker card, had fallen out of where he's kind of pushed papers and stuff back behind the seat. And I remember this playing card falling out and I bent down and picked it up to stuff it back in the truck and flipped it over and it was porn. It was a pornographic, a novelty card. And I remember looking at this as a nine-year-old and many of you know your first encounter with pornography, it seared something on me. I didn't know what I was seeing but I knew it wasn't right. I knew this wasn't my mommy who was in the house right there, and I couldn't believe this was my daddy's, and so I shoved it back in the truck and tried to act like I hadn't seen anything. And it started as a shame and a feeling of guilt and like heat and fear and confusion. And if it did not evolve into a curiosity, and an interest. Because that's exactly what sin and perversion stamped on our hearts does. It coaxes us like sirens to the cliff. And so as a child, I'm exposed to porn and it starts as feeling terrifying and then I'm wondering why I felt the things I did and what that was and if there was more. And I started seeking these things out and began what was a decade-long addiction really to pornography. Now, wait for the older people to stand up and walk out, but here's the reality. There is a woman talking about struggles with porn and it's important that we do. Because pornography is an epidemic that is, is so permeated our society that we would be the most naive of hypocritical Christians if we sat here and thought, oh, though that's just an unsaved male issue. The reality is that in one year, in 2016 alone, on one pornographic website, one site, one year, there are hundreds of thousands of sites, we as a people consumed 4.6 billion hours of porn in one year on one website. That's 17,000 complete lifetimes of porn. 
consumed in one year on one website. Porn is an academic that is affecting men, it is affecting women, it is affecting children. The average age of exposure to pornography right now is nine years old. That's the average. It's on the school bus. It's ravaging our culture and it is ravaging the church and the body of Christ and it grieves the heart of God. And it deeply impacted me and my story. But I remember my mom sitting on the couch in an all-out panic, as I would probably be if my child came and talked to me about the things I probably said to her. But she, she, she um, tried to kind of summarize the moment and bring things around as she could. And I remember her explaining, well, honey, um, what, what God wants is that, that we would be virgins until we marry. I was a virgin when I married your father. He was a virgin when he married me. And we are to save ourselves and be virgins when we marry. And that is reserved for your husband. And I'm, again, theatrical. And I was bold and crazy. And I remember standing up, interrupting her mid-sentence and proclaiming, then mother, if you were a virgin, I will be a virgin too. And I marched out of the room and made this proclamation that I would save myself until my wedding day, which is beautiful and incredible and incomplete. Because when we often make these narrow proclamations of virginity, and we miss the conversation of a heart's purity, then really it's a works-based answer to a life surrender question. God says, I want all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, all of your strength. And we say, well, how about I give you some semi-good behavior? Because inevitably, walking this balance beam of works, of I am just going to save this piece for then, leads us right into the gray area. And about 98% of y'all know exactly what I'm talking about. Because I was struggling with porn, addicted really. And as I moved through high school and into college, I was testing the boundaries as far as I could go. What could I get away with? What couldn't I? Really, when a works-based answer becomes our response to God wanting all of us, the purity of our heart, a heart surrendered and in love with him, trusting him, following his word, knowing that he knows what is best for us, when our response is, I'll give you a, a, a piece of that and I'll work towards this one thing, inevitably, the question of our heart becomes, okay, how far is too far? Like what still counts? And what can I do? And what can I get away with? And what won't have the repercussions that the world would see? But how far is too far? And if there is not a father in heaven who is yearning for the questions of our heart to shift to God, how close can I draw near to you? When the question is how far is too far, your flesh is leading you. And it led me into dangerous territory where I waved this proud banner of virgin, right? Yet I'm struggling with porn, I'm pushing the envelope, and I will never forget waking up one morning and in college. This is why I, I die to come speak to college age groups because it was the most formative time in my life when it came to an understanding and an, a, a Paul on the road to Damascus scales falling from my eyes understanding of these things. It was a morning I woke up in college the all-American athlete, I don't know if they introed any of that. I played soccer at LSU. I was an all-American athlete. I was um, successful on the surface, good grades, good sports, a, a name on campus. And I woke up one morning wearing the mask, and everyone thought I was a great, good girl. I talked a lot about God, um, yet I lived a very different life in the darkness. I won't even call it privacy because we've perverted that. We call it privacy, we think we're entitled to keep some things, it's just our things and we are actually just festering in darkness. Very broken things we just hide in. And this was me and I woke up after a drunken night. These are my BC days before Christ. I woke up after a drunken night <laughs> And I'm replaying the night in my head, trying to remember everything that had happened and what we had done and who had been there. And all of a sudden, like an absolute knife in the gut, 
I realized, wait a second. Who was that guy who kind of joined in in the middle of the night, and what had he said? Someone had mentioned maybe that he was separated, or was he divorced, or was he still married? I know they had said wife, and why was I then alone with him in the kitchen, and what did I do in that moment, and am I an adulteress? Is adultery now on my story because I was just involved with a married man because I wanted to do what I wanted to do? And because it was the little steps of God, I want to choose what's best for me here, and I'm in control. That's always our anthem, right? I know what I'm doing. It's my body. I'm in control. Certainly, I'm not a pawn here, and yet we are a pawn to the enemy's schemes in our lives dismantling us with sexual brokenness, and I woke up realizing how far have I fallen and how naive have I been. And what is going on? And the shame was crushing, and the guilt was overwhelming, and the fear that someone would find out about all of these things, not just the adultery, it was all the pieces of the puzzle, was crippling. And some of you in here are crippled by the buildup of these things. Oh, but here's what I love about God. It was not long after that he interrupted my life in a tremendous way. If you'd like to know the details, come tomorrow to chapel. We'll speak about the testimony. But he interrupted my life, collided with my story, and suddenly there was a collision when it came to my sexual understanding and my identity and my thoughts of God because crushed under the weight of all of this sexual sin and pushing it down and rationalizing and not really responding when I knew it was wrong and hoping I could avoid the consequences and, and, and dismissing that everyone else is doing it and this is fine and this is just how we are as young people. People, as college kids, literally when I was alone at night, crushed under the weight of that, because we are, I was so afraid that surely God was done with me. There was, there was no redemption story here. I had done the whole pray the prayer and respond and, and ask forgiveness and then try to do it well and then stumble again. I had lived this inconsistent roller coaster ride of faith on the surface for everyone around me, but I was terrified of God truly seeing these things. And it wasn't until Jesus collided with my story, pulled the scales from my eyes, where like we read in the scripture, we opened our ears, opened opened our eyes, postured my heart for a moment to say, God, what would you have of me? What were you saying here? That's when I realized God had a great deal to say about sex and the word, and some of the most profound things he has to say are some of the most redemptive and beautiful and powerful things to a heart and a life that are crushed by sexual sin. What I see when I looked at the word was John 4 and the woman at the well. I see the Samaritan woman who was a whore by all accounts. If we can just get real and honest and have some, some, some transparent dialogue of what we would say or see in someone else now and quick to throw a stone at, this woman is alone at high noon drawing water. It's because she really didn't want to be seen or known by the people around. She's a loner crushed under the weight of so much of what she's navigated through, and I love that this is exactly where Jesus meets her. And he sits by her well, and he offers her living water that she would never thirst again. And she's like, yes, I want that living water. And what I love is that he actually then takes a moment to address the most important and pressing thing in this woman, which is her sexual sin. He says, okay, we'll go and get your husband. Jesus is sometimes sassy. I don't know how you read the word, but I read it rich in drama. He knows what's going on, but he says, go and get your husband. And she's like, I don't have a husband. And he's like, I know, Messiah. I'm well aware. Uh, you've had five. And the man you're living with now, you're not even married to. And we see this as a simple exchange. Some of us have read this story a thousand times over, but what if that was you? Because that was me. 
broken and dejected and overwhelmed and consumed by sexual sin. And when Jesus interrupted my story, one of the very first things he reached in and dug out were the very things I wish I could have pressed the furthest down. It was my sexual sin. And he says to the Samaritan woman, he draws these things up out of her. It's an uncomfortable moment, and I'm sick of us as Christians wanting our faith walk to be comfortable. We don't want a Jesus who's here to refine us and sanctify us. We want a Jesus who's comfortable and easy and looks like what we want him to look like. But the Jesus of the Bible was never afraid to encounter and reach down and draw out the most broken of things, and that's because he had the very living water that would heal and redeem them. This is who Jesus is. He comes to the well, he sits by her, and he stays. And he offers her living water that she would never thirst again, and they wrestle through these things. And do you know what I love about the Samaritan woman? is that she does not encounter that confrontation from Jesus and say, whoa, 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 that's not me. You're thinking of the other Samaritan woman. There are many back in town. She doesn't deny it. She doesn't run off and hide from it. She doesn't stuff it down like we like to do. She is overwhelmed and she says, who are you? You must be a prophet. And he's like, oh, if you only knew who I am. And it's with the Samaritan woman, the person with the sexual brokenness, it's the first person in the Gospels who Jesus gives explicit permission to, to evangelize. He shares with her, no, I am the Messiah. If you read the scriptures, he's encountering people, he's moving in power, but he's repeatedly saying, don't tell anyone what I've done, don't tell anyone what happened here, and inevitably people do, but it was with this intimate encounter that he met this person, this woman with sexual brokenness, and he says, I am the Messiah. And what I love is she doesn't run off in shame. She picks up her robe and she runs back to town with another man's name on her lips. What would that look like? Another man's name on her lips. Don't you think these people were tired of this woman and the men she brought around? But was different this time is that she ran back with the name above all names on her lips. And it says that many came to believe in response to her faithfulness. They begged Jesus to come back to town and many more followed him. What I see is a generation and a college generation, especially right now, back to the well, drawing up water. I know I should do better. I should be better. I'm at a Christian school. I know these things in my mind. I, I, I worship and I feel the conviction and it's all confusing, but I can do this. And we move back in to our world, to our environment, and inevitably we struggle and we stumble and it's the same deal again. And are you not tired? I was tired of the back and forth, the back and forth. I can do this, I can walk in this, I just don't need to put myself in this environment or do that, and inevitably I'm back here. And it wasn't until Jesus encountered me and offered living water that I realized, wait a second, we are not to be shamed by silence. He came to give us life, to renew us, to purify us, to heal us, and I'm about to pick up my robes and run back to tell anyone who will listen about the one who came to set the captives free. And many of us are enslaved and don't even realize it. But I don't serve a, a, a king who we cope through life with. I serve a king who came to set the captives free. That we would walk in freedom and truth and purity and self-control and surrender and literacy of this word that is literal food and living water to our soul. When I look at this scripture, I see a Jesus in John 8 who encountered the adulteress to be stoned. Caught red-handed in the midst of her sin. This is for those who have been caught with the repercussion and the abortion followed or the shame followed or whatever it was that has crippled you at this point in walking in any sort of boldness in your faith. In fact, it scorned you to God. Uh, you won't like me for saying it, but it, it's the reality is that we're a generation of compartmentalized conscience. We wanna do what we wanna do, 
and we want to worship God, and even though he tells us the consequences, we want to do what we want to do, and we think these things are separate, and it's not till they come crashing together and the consequences manifest that suddenly we realize, oh, he wasn't kidding, and somehow we then get mad at him. We distance ourselves from God. Though he told us what was best for us, and we rebelled. I see the adulteress to be stoned, caught red-handed, surrounded by people who had a, a fate written out for her. And when I see Jesus encounter this woman in this story, stones fall all around him. And there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, but instead, when everyone's left and everyone's gone, she lifts her head and sees the Son of God standing there. She says, they're gone. He says, no one's here to condemn you. And she said, no, they've left. And he said, then I condemn you neither. Now go and sin no more. We're a grace-abusing generation that wants to stop it. Now I condemn you neither. Oh, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Well, it was a rough patch in college, but I got away with all that because his grace is there and it's sufficient and that's good enough and so that's awesome and so back to doing me. No, do we understand that there's a difference between forgiveness and repentance? You see, forgiveness is realizing the repercussions of our actions. It's going with a grieved heart and asking to be forgiven, and it's beautiful and it's powerful, but repentance is a step further where we go with a grieved heart. Man, we're a generation that needs to re-embrace shame because we're shameless in many ways, and we've almost perverted the fact that Jesus frees us of shame. Yes, he does, but that does not mean we should not be ashamed of shameful sin that grieves the heart of the Father. It's what draws us to repentance not to say, I've done wrong and there's a repercussion coming, but to say, God, I have sinned in your eyes. And I'm grieved because you love me and I love you. And I want your forgiveness. Would you have mercy on me? And I will repent. Here's the difference. I will turn away from that sin. I will sin no more. In Christ, it is possible. You are my comfort. You are my help. You are my hope. You are my redeemer. You are my strength. You are the one who can make my path straight. And it may hurt my flesh, and it may hurt my emotions. Oh, we don't want our emotions hurt. We don't want to deny our flesh. But what if in denial of our flesh, our spirit could rise? What if that's what it meant when he said to crucify ourselves with Christ? That we would say, your ways are good, God. And you're not just here for behavior modification. You came for heart transformation. Create in me a clean heart. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Oh, the number of scriptures that reiterate this. It's not what goes into your body that defiles you. You're defiled by what comes for your heart. He wants to transform our hearts. Because pure actions flow from a pure heart, impure actions flow from an impure heart. God blesses those whose hearts are pure, for they will see God, Matt 5, 8, create in me a clean heart, Psalm 41, 10. But it is returning to him with a repentant heart. Say, God, create in me a clean heart. Whatever it costs, whatever it looks like, your redemption, your mercy, is good and complete. And I will repent and turn and sin no more. I don't care what it costs me. I don't care what type of accountability I have to set up. I don't care if I have to break up with my boyfriend, break up with my girlfriend. I don't care if it means coming to my husband or my wife in a vulnerable, honest, humble position. Whatever it takes, Lord, your ways are better than mine. I want to know you and be known by you. We're a thirsty generation that's dying for intimacy. And he is the one our souls are hungry and thirsty to be intimate with. 
but we're seeking it in everything that's quick and fleeting. Oh no, take of living water. That we would never thirst again. Repent of our sins. Turn our hearts back to God. If they would see with their eyes, if they would hear with their ears, they would understand with their hearts and turn and I will heal them. You are so loved, it's crazy. You're fashioned, formed, purposed for such a time as this. And you're at a university, many of you in the Bible college, wanting to be used by God. But the only way we can be sustainably used by him is if we first allow ourselves to know him and be known by him. Even when it hurts and it's hard, even when it drums up the messy stuff. He's not finished with you yet. I'm so grateful he wasn't finished with me yet. Would we be like the Samaritan woman who encounters his grace and run into evangelism? Like the adulteress who turned and sinned no more, not to follow the rules better, but because in response to his great love and mercy, we would follow him, we would pick up our cross and carry it. I know this is a topic that can be unpacked in about a thousand different ways. It spirals off in about a million different directions in our culture. We've kind of removed absolute truth from the equation and opened Pandora's box and we're hurting. I just want this generation of college-aged people, young people to know he wants to use you. He loves you. You're set apart. But when I look at Matt 7, I see that there are many who will stand before him and say, Lord, Lord, and he will actually say, I never knew you. And what's crazy to me is that they argue back to him in Matthew 7. They say, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. Didn't you see all the things we did for you, Lord? We cast out demons, we performed miracles, we prophesied. And he says, yes, but I never knew you. And so we're seeking intimacy in all of the places that instantly fill, but is it at the cost of knowing intimacy with him that when we would stand before him, he would say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Oh, I know your story, your backstory. Goodness, take it from the, the porn addicted, promiscuous, broken girl. It matters more that we would stand before him and he would say, Well done. I don't want to hear, I never knew you, because I never allowed myself to be known. It's the restoration of these things that fell apart, our image-bearing identity he gave us, the intimacy that he knit within us. Would they be restored and reconciled by the grace of Jesus? Would we hunger and thirst for righteousness? I know you're tired of carrying what you're carrying, and your mom's sitting next to you, so you don't want to squirm. But I was really tired, too, and Scripture says, come to me if you're weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. And we're having a lot of conversations as a culture that address a lot of the symptoms. But the root, it's like putting Band-Aids on bullet holes if we don't talk about the root, which is the heart. And he wants to restore your heart. Redeem you. Would we turn back to him? Let's pray. Oh, dear Jesus, we thank you, God. We thank you that the conversation of sex doesn't have to sit around simple things that are abused and overused and twisted and laughable and comical. God, no, sex is your creation. Our sexuality is stamped into us, knit into us by our creator. God, we thank you for this gift of our sexuality, of our identity, of our life that you gave us with plans, with purpose. 
God, we don't want behavior modification any longer. It's exhausting and it doesn't last. We want heart transformation. Lord, I pray over this group that if you come to their well, God, they would sit, open their ears, open their eyes, open their hearts to your truth, your love, your living water. God, I pray that in their fear that they would be shamed or condemned or ridiculed if they opened up and found accountability for the struggle of pornography or for the promiscuity or for the impure relationship they're in, God, I pray that you would allow those stones to fall around them and they would hear only your voice, see only your eyes that says, I condemn you not. Now go and sin no more. God, would lives in this room have trajectories that shift tonight in response to your great love and mercy. We don't deserve it. We haven't earned it, God, yet you have poured it out on us. Realign our hearts with yours. Fix our eyes on yours. Open our ears to hear. Pull the scales from our eyes to see. It is good to follow you, to be known by you, to know you. Would people not miss the destiny, the purpose you have over their lives for the temporary fix of an enemy's deceit, that a feel-good moment now is sustainable to an intimacy they're so lacking? God, would they know intimacy with you? Would we all know intimacy with you? And would we find the courage to open our mouths, to get the enemy beneath our heel, God? He is squashed under your great love and mercy. Would we not take the cross for granted? Would we walk in boldness that is predicated by humility? We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you guys so much for letting me join y'all.